Yeah, first of all, thanks to the organizer for inviting me. And um, I will tell you about uh, experiments we have been performing on precision tests of gravitational physics using atomic quantum sensors. And um, I will mainly speak about experiments we have been doing in Florence, but these are also representative of uh, experiments which are going on uh, in several labs uh, worldwide, and we have today already high level uh, examples. But anyway, if you want to uh, read more um, in terms of overview, uh, aiming to be uh, rather uh, exhaustive, you can look at this um, review here in quantum science and technology. Okay, the, the general idea we heard already today is that uh, in an atom interferometer, in some way that uh, in the modern interferometers is always using laser light, you split the wave pack, the atomic wave packet, you reflect and recombine, and so at the output you get interference fringes. And then uh, as a function of, uh, for example, the gravitational uh, acceleration, this um, uh, interference pattern gets uh, a phase. And so we saw also this uh, already uh, today, but just to remind you, the, the phase uh, uh, in presence of an acceleration uh, G is given by this expression, uh, the square of the time uh, between the pulses in this case. This is for a Raman interferometer, but it's rather general. Um, Okay, the acceleration and K is the wave vector of the light that you use to, as I said, to split, recombine, and reflect the uh, two parts of the interferometer. Okay, if you put, okay, and then you can understand that this can be used as a gravimeter uh, because if you know these quantities, then uh, you can measure gravity acceleration. And uh, what is interesting is that if you put realistic numbers, as you will see, these are very uh, close to the ones that uh, we have in our one of our, our apparatus. So for example, uh, one million rubidium atoms, uh, so signal to noise uh, uh, of 1000, um, which is in fact the case in our in interferometer, which is uh, limited by short noise. Uh, and then uh, 150 milliseconds, um, then you get a sensitivity of the order in the measurement of gravity acceleration of the order of 10 to minus 9 g per shot. Shot means uh, essentially this is done in an atomic fountain. You launch the atom, it takes about one second. So this is essentially the sensitivity with these numbers uh, per second, more or less. Uh, the first experiment. Um, that uh, we performed. So I, I started this atom interferometer in Italy about year 2000, 2001. And the, the main initial motivation, the first funding that I got, was uh, to perform this experiment measuring the value of the gravitational constant uh, using as a sensor uh, atoms instead of uh, microscopic uh, balls, let's say. And the motivation is still valid, as we will see, but at that time it was really, the situation was really striking because you see the Codata 1998, so when, as I said, we started the experiment, uh, the value of the gravitational constant was affected by an uncertainty of the order of one part per thousand. And this is uh, due not to the single measurement, single experiment uncertainty, as you see here, but to the fact that different measurements in different labs with different apparatus give uh, values, uh, give values which are completely inconsistent with each other. And so the Codata committee takes a sort of average uh, of these values. It statistically is not correct because they are inconsistent, but anyway, uh, they make this adjustment. And at that time there was a, an experiment done at PTB in Germany that was 40 standard deviations away and it had to be taken into account because Germany. And uh, so the, the error bar was uh, <laughs> really large. But then as far as I know, this experiment, the authors retracted uh, because they realized that there was some, uh, uh, in some mistake, let's say, some imprecision. 
and so then the value remain uh, became smaller and smaller, but still of the order of parts in 10 to the 4. And all the experiment at that time had been done a la Cavendish, so uh, different uh, variations, uh, the idea of a torsion balance, torsion pendulum with microscopic masses. So this was the first uh, uh, experiment uh, trying to measure uh, at least for, from the probe point of view using a, an atomic, you can say a quantum sensor uh, to measure this quantity. Of course, this is a difficult experiment because the thing, gravity is very weak and there, are, there is a lot of noise of any kind, including gravitational noise. And so uh, we try to uh, design the apparatus on purpose for this experiment, so as differential as possible. So instead of one atom interferometer, one sensor, we have two in a gradiometer configuration, so that, for example, we subtract the tidal effects, the changes of gravity, which are much, much larger than the effect that we want to see. Um, and then the source masses that in our experiments uh, uh, were about 500 kilograms of tungsten. Tungsten is a uh, high density material, so 500 kilograms is not a big uh, uh, piece uh, of material. Um, and so this was done with two sets of masses that could be moved in different positions. So we had a sort of lock-in detection, slow lock-in, but still a lock-in detection to subtract uh, other uh, sources of spurious signals. And then other tricks which are more specific inversion of the K-vector and so on. And so based on the uh, numbers that I gave you before, the 500 uh, kilogram of tanks, tungsten give a, a, um, an acceleration of the order of 10 to minus 7 g. As I said, we have a, a sensitivity of the order of 10 to minus 9 g per shot. And so in one shot, in terms of precision, we can measure this quantity, this uh, constant uh, with a 1% precision. And integrating over 10,000 seconds, uh, we can get to this uh, precision, one part in 10 to the four. That was the goal of this experiment. So this took, as all the uh, big G experiment, they all take years and years. So this was also a relatively long experiment. I just give you the final uh, uh, results. Uh, the, this is how the, the apparatus was performing uh, when the, uh, we uh, took the data. The repetition period, so the launch, the selection, all the atomic um, uh, was uh, about two seconds. Uh, okay, so we were, this we already saw in some other presentation, we were, uh, since we have two interferometers, each interferometer gives you an interference pattern. Each of the, of the two is affected by a lot of noise. You will not see the fringes because of vibrations, but the two are correlated. And so we plot the signal as a sort of Lisa Zhu uh, uh, figure plotting one interference, atomic interference signal as a function of the other. So we get ellipses and the shape of these ellipses uh, gives you the relevant uh, signal. And so you see here the two ellipses with the masses in one position or the other. And this is the re resulting signal. This is the modulation of the gravitational signal produced by these uh, source masses. Okay, these are the sensitivity level. As I said, we were limited with about 10, four times to the five uh, atoms per each cloud. We were limited essentially by the short noise. And so the integration time took about uh, 100 hours. And so th this is the result we obtained. Uh, this is the number with the uh, uh, statistical and systematic uncertainty. And the overall relative uncertainty is of the order 100, is 150 parts per million. <clears throat> this value now is included in the last adjustments of the uh, fundamental constant values. So this is how it's quoted as lens, but this was not done at lens, but uh, was funded by the Institute of Physical Nuclear or Nuclear Physics Institute. And um, Anyway, this is one number in the more or less 300 numbers. Uh, this constant has been measured more than 300 times. So 
it is interesting, as I said, because it's the first time that you use something new to probe. But by itself, it's not, in my opinion, the number itself is not so uh, interesting. What is interesting is, the, is that there are other experiments which have been either proposed or going on or being constructed uh, that are uh, going to uh, measure the same constant um, with atomic uh, sensors. And so it, would, it will be nice to see if at the end uh, these numbers will uh, be more consistent than the others have been so far. And this experiment, there is a, an old experiment in Stanford. I, I don't have recent news, uh, um, but there is a paper here. Uh, and then re, uh, more recently, an experiment was started in China, in Wuhan, that has conceptually the same idea of our experiment, but the, the, the apparatus is different. Um, the group of Olga Mueller and Berkeley proposed a, a different scheme, uh, which is more based on the Aronoff bomb effect. And uh, our chairman is uh, building a, an apparatus that I consider very interesting uh, in um, this frame uh, using uh, strontium instead of rubidium that was the case in our experiment and using a source mass which is uh, silicon instead of tungsten and i think this will is a very nice um, has very good prospects and a, a new experiment is going on in florence uh, which is being built uh, under the uh, I mean, the, the responsible is Gabriele Rossi, who got uh, an ERC funding, funding by European Research Council to perform a new experiment of the gravitational constant. And generally speaking, the, the goal is to go uh, to improve by one order of magnitude the precision compared to our uh, previous experiment, go towards one punch in 10 to the 5, which is better than the present uh, values. Okay, so this was done uh, in our experiment with uh, Raman interferometry using rubidium atoms um, with the same essentially variations on the same apparatus. We perform uh, also other experiments. For example, in in this paper, we published um, an, uh, the results of an experiment uh, in which instead of launching two clouds, we were launching three clouds of atoms, interrogating the three at the same time. So essentially, while with one you measure gravity acceleration, with two you measure the gradient, with three you measure the additional derivative, the curvature that you can call the curvature of the uh, potential, gravitational potential. A um, couple of years later, uh, the group of Mark Asevich, uh, Jason Hogan, uh, Tim Kovacic, published uh, this paper where, as far as I understand, they were measuring the same quantity with a different uh, scheme. I mean, still with atoms, but not exactly as we were doing. But they proposed it as a measurement of the space-time curvature, uh, which is, I would say, more appealing than just saying that you're measuring the additional derivative. Uh, Ah, uh, sounds better. No, the, the curvature is then some, all this, as I will not speak about that, all this technology, of course, has also applications in terms of uh, detection of gravitational anomalies due to uh, no mass somewhere. And, but I'm not going to talk about that. Going instead to the very fundamental uh, physics that uh, we have tried to address in our experiments, we uh, still with that apparatus, we perform this experiment um, that is um, uh, in the frame of testing the equivalence principle that we heard already today. What we have done was essentially to um, uh, measure gravity acceleration for the atoms in different uh, states. So we were measuring and comparing the gravity acceleration for atoms in one uh, eigenstate, so this is a rubidium, there are two hyperfine, hyperfine uh, substates in the ground state. So we were measuring gravity acceleration for one uh, atoms in one uh, eigenstate, in the other eigenstate, and this had already been done uh, before. 
even by the group of uh, Ted Hensch. And, and on that, uh, we improved by a couple of orders of magnitude. But what was uh, more interesting in this experiment, and this was based, uh, uh, I mean, came uh, from a collaboration with Charles Bruckner and Magdalena Zick, and uh, it is based on uh, models that also Igor mentioned before, where the mass, you see, is a heart as a possible operator. Anyway, what we did was to measure gravity acceleration for also for atoms in a superposition state. Now you can be, I mean, you can believe more or less the underlying theory, but I think that while uh, some people claim that uh, when we make experiment as uh, Nasser has been talking about today, dropping atoms, some people say, okay, dropping atoms more or less is like dropping rocks and uh, you get a higher precision with rocks so far than with atoms. Uh, this experiment cannot be done with rocks. This is a purely uh, quantum uh, test. Then on the relevance, then we can discuss. But it, it is a, an example of an experiment that can be done only with a quantum sensor. And these are the numbers that we achieved for a possible, um, I mean, for the Etwash uh, uh, ratio for the atoms in the two eigenstates or in the superposition state. And finally, on the same apparatus based on rubidium, I will talk about uh, experiments with rubidium and with strontium. Anticipated now I will switch to strontium, but you know, in these experiments, the choice of the atom is important uh, in practice. Um, recently, we published uh, this paper that is maybe a little bit technical, but what we did was uh, all the experiments done so far with rubidium, the atom interferometer experiment, were done with uh, using light, laser light, uh, resonant, I mean, close to the resonance transition of rubidium, which is at 780 nanometer. In this experiment, we developed the technology to use instead the transition going to a higher level. So the transition is in the blue. So you see that the wavelength is essentially half of the, uh, the one that is usually used in, in the experiment. And so you gain on the K on the, on the wave vector, and then in the sensitivity, you gain a factor of two. It's not dramatic, but it's a simple way to gain a factor of two in sensitivity. And of course, if you do large momentum transfer, this, uh, then uh, uh, you keep this gain in sensitivity. And these are the fringes we obtained, the, the ellipses we obtained uh, with the blue transition. And this is the signal instead with the 780 nanometers. And so you see the gain in sensitivity in the phase uh, uh, with the blue light compared to the infrared light, let's say. Okay, this is, uh, this is a demonstration that this is a useful uh, uh, technology. To be improved, we need a higher uh, laser power because um, we were limited by scattering of photons from um, excited levels. So we need a higher detuning and then a higher power. But except for this that just requires, for example, a titanium sapphire laser instead of the diode laser that we were using, this is a very promising technology, also for the new experiment on Big G. And we demonstrated that both for uh, Raman transitions and also for uh, a Bragg uh, interferometry, as you see here. Okay, and now, as I said, I, I switch to strontium. Uh, we have been working uh, on strontium now for several years. Uh, first, uh, with the interest uh, for, uh, you know, precision spectroscopy and then uh, optical clocks, uh, what we already heard uh, uh, in this conference. And then we transferred uh, the idea also to uh, atom interferometry. So the choice of strontium uh, was very uh, uh, lucky for optical clocks. We already saw this um, picture. And uh, um, I'm particularly interested in that because my first uh, paper on uh, 
measuring the, the intercombination line of strontium was, goes back to 1992. And then uh, we followed all the development of the optical clock, so using the frequency comb, and then uh, you know the, the idea of the magic wavelength came. Uh, and then, uh, okay, with the collaboration with PTB, we developed what can be considered the first transportable strontium optical clock. Now you cannot see the numbers here, but in 1992, it was still interesting and uh, what being published aligned with those six megahertz. 20 years later, uh, we had uh, uh, eight hertz. So about um, six orders of magnitude in 20 years that corresponds to the general trend that I showed you before. Okay, this was for the clock. Uh, so we said, uh, why don't we try this atom also for atom interferometry that had essentially never been done before, I would say. And so the first experiment, because strontium has some specific features, it's not just to try. And so the first experiment we did was to superimpose to the cold, here you see the trap of uh, strontium atoms, is a blob here. And we superimposed a vertical uh, uh, laser, this green light here, uh, that was retroreflected, so an optical lattice, vertical optical lattice. And so we could observe these uh, oscillations. So these are the atoms that fall, that are not trapped in the lattice, but the atoms that are trapped perform these block oscillations, these oscillations that are the block oscillations that we all already heard uh, today. And the frequency of the block oscillation in this case is given by the mass of the atom, gravity acceleration, and the wavelength of the light that you use for the optical lattice, divided by Planck constant. So this is very interesting because you have a, a very a small uh, sensor. You just have to uh, load the atoms in a few wells, uh, which is a few hundred nanometers. So you have a sensor of the order of one micron, let's say, that if you measure the frequency of these oscillations, this is a slowed movie. In our case, it was about uh, 600 Hertz. You measure the frequency and you can measure gravity at a distance of a, of a micron. And so, uh, first of all, uh, the choice of strontium, uh, uh, we demonstrated that it was good also for interferometry because uh, in a, um, the following experiment, we, found, we observed uh, these block oscillations going on for a time of uh, up to 20 seconds. So this is a quantum effect that uh, keeps coherence for uh, about 20 seconds. And we know that then, for example, in Holger Mueller experiments, they went up to 60 seconds so far. But at that time, it was uh, quite interesting by itself as an effect. But then this combination of a gravimeter uh, with a resolution of a few microns, I thought it was the right uh, tool to try and measure gravity at very small distances of the order of a few microns. And so the idea was to bring this uh, sample of atoms close to same idea of the big G experiment, but with a very small source mass and bringing the atoms at a few microns and measuring directly gravity there. Of course, the idea was very nice, but we know that going close to surfaces is, uh, uh, you, you have to expect problems. And in fact, when, uh, what we found is that uh, we, when we brought our atomic sensor at a distance of a couple of millimeters, the signal was still uh, uh, the good one. Fourier limited, no problem from the surface. But then when we went closer, uh, closer, I mean, uh, you see, 700 micron, 200 micron, there was some effect, some decoherence effect that was uh, spoiling our signal, bringing the signal down, broadening it. And so essentially, we did not, uh, at some point, we gave up. Uh, there was no more interest in also in my student. And I, we had to give up. And so this was not even uh, published, uh, but you can find uh, what I'm telling you now, some, some more details in this, uh, uh, in this book, in my lecture, in this uh, Barenna School book. Okay, 
And yeah, another experiment that we perform using strontium is um, uh, still in the frame of uh, equivalence principle test uh, was uh, uh, comparing a gravity acceleration for two different, two different isotopes, uh, strontium-88 and strontium-87. This was in the table of uh, Nasser today. And this is um, uh, interesting because uh, these are different isotopes. Uh, strontium-88 has a zero uh, total spin, while strontium-87 has a nuclear spin of nine half. And strontium-88 is a boson, while strontium-87 is a fermion. So there are theories, you know, connected to the coupling of uh, uh, gravity to spin that are relevant for this. And there are also papers on the interest of uh, investigating gravity for bosons and fermions. And um, also Lorenza Viola has uh, written uh, something uh, that is vaguely related to that, I would say, but uh, she can tell more. I, anyway, this is interesting uh, from uh, the theoretical point of view. And um, Actually, one criticism we found uh, we had is that uh, uh, searching for a, a coupling between spin and gravity is not searching for a violation, but it is something which is predicted, not observed, but predicted. So it's not a in that sense, it's not a search of a violation of the equivalence principle, but when you include spin in the theory, you can predict a coupling. Uh, Anyway, we did not observe it, but at least we could set an upper value to a possible coupling between the spin and gravity. This is an experiment that was already mentioned today, uh, uh, performing um, atom interferometry using the the strontium clock transition, 698, the transition from the singlet S0 to the triplet T0, the same transition that used for the optical clock. And uh, in this paper, as was already said today, we could uh, demonstrate as a proof of principle on a very small scale uh, what is uh, the um, general idea for these uh, also large scale uh, interferometers that we held. In, uh, in my talk today. And this is also uh, now going on in the frame of this uh, experiment uh, led by Nicola Paul in our group, uh, where uh, he's developing a new apparatus for strontium and also for cadmium, a different atom, to perform different uh, uh, tests of gravitational physics. And in particular, yes, thank you, um, uh, based uh, on uh, papers by uh, Magdalena Zick, uh, Sasla Bruckner, uh, uh, I guess uh, Igor Pikoski. <laughs> um, this is quite interesting proposal because there is this idea of, um, uh, that I think again was discussed at some point in this meeting, that if you have a, a, a a gravitational potential, which is large enough, a difference in gravitational potential, which is large enough for the two arms of the interferometer, at some point you get uh, a which path information. And so you expect to have um, a decoherence effect. But also they predict that uh, you can change the parameter. So this is a nice uh, effect, but then you can say, okay, decoherence can come from different effects and then you don't discover anything, but they also predict that you can uh, uh, act on the parameters of the experiment and see some revival of the interference. So it's a characteristic pattern that it would be very interesting to observe. And as was said today, the, this is the transition, which is at the basis, uh, which is the fundamental uh, tool for these uh, large scale systems. Um, uh, both on ground and in the future in space, uh, as was first proposed in a paper uh, by Nan New and uh, colleagues, uh, and um, then uh, uh, investigated also by Markasevich and colleagues. 
Okay, based on this idea, some years ago, we proposed this uh, mission to the European Space Agency, Space Atomic Gravity Explorer, uh, with the primary goal to observe gravitational waves in new frequency ranges, and then search for dark matter, measure gravitational uh, redshift, all the beautiful things that we already discussed during this meeting. And uh, I'm not going to repeat, uh, I would say. Okay, that project was killed by the European Space Agency panel, as far as I understand, mostly because it would have been not obscured, but somehow that would have been a competitor for LISA, so no way. But we did not give up and under a better uh, leadership than mine, I mean by Olivier Buchmuller and John Ellis. Now we are reproposing this idea as the ed EDGE mission which is becoming more and more interesting as a space mission, as, as was mentioned today, possibly also as a, an experiment on ground, maybe at CERN, as a European uh, uh, equivalent of what has been developed in the United States. Okay, so that's most of what I wanted to tell you. Just let me mention that uh, we recently entered a collaboration that is aiming to perform uh, related experiments on positronium. So testing gravity, measuring gravity acceleration for positronium. This is, uh, you know, the kind of physics that so far has been done with uh, anti-hydrogen, testing gravity for antimatter. But positronium is different. Uh, uh, compared to anti-hydrogen, it's made of two leptons. The mass is the mass of the two leptons, so there is some interest in that. And uh, in this uh, very recent paper, we proposed um, a scheme that, at least in principle, with difficult numbers, might allow us to measure gravity acceleration um, with a precision of uh, 0.1 in a, re a relativity uh, reasonable integration time. Yeah, the pro just to tell you the problem of uh, uh, positronium is that uh, all the lifetime, you can, this is the le uh, partial level scheme. You can notice that the lifetime of the ground state is 140 nanoseconds. If you excite it to the first excited state, then you have one microsecond. So compared to experiments with atoms, this experiment must be done uh, in one microsecond. But uh, we propose this scheme, which is taking advantage of an um, atom interferometry scheme proposed, uh, demonstrated by Jason Hogan, which is what uh, you want also to use uh, in your experiment. So. Okay, so um, uh, let me uh, finally, really finally tell you that uh, at some point, this experiment will be limited in precision uh, by in sensitivity by um, shot noise. And as I said, our big G apparatus was already uh, shot noise limited. And so we entered a little bit the game of uh, atomic squeezing uh, as newcomers. We are not the big experts that we heard already during this conference. But uh, my main, I mean, our focus was clearly producing uh, squeezed atoms to be injected in an atom interferometer with separated arms, the kind of interferometers that I showed to you um, that we are uh, using in our experiments. And so in this paper, in uh, collaboration with Vlad and Buletic, we propose essentially this idea where the, um, we have two uh, states which are separated in momentum uh, uh, produced by a Bragg transition in the blue. And then we exploit this narrow line, 689 narrow intercombination line of strontium to probe in a dispersive way the atoms which are in a cavity. So uh, you had a much better explanation of all of these by previous speakers. So what um, since this is uh, essentially aiming to then using this source uh, in our fountain experiments, we have uh, this configuration for the cavity, a four mirror, a bow tie cavity. And so we have the vertical uh, uh, direction, which is free. So once we produce the 
uh, squeezed atoms in principle we would be uh, we would be in the position then to have an interferometer with these uh, squeezed uh, states and on the paper uh, in principle you can get to a 20 db uh, meteorological gain on the paper uh, we have the system built, we have the cavity in vacuum, um, and uh, recently we observed uh, the, the effect of the atoms going through the waste of the cavity. And this is the status of the experiment, uh, no, no, I mean, preliminary uh, research. So I would close by acknowledging uh, the people who have been doing the work that I showed to you today, the funding institutions, and uh, Thank you for your attention. Very nice talk. Uh, can you explain again how the squeezing is done? What, what is the mechanism behind it? Yeah. So, uh, the way I explain it is that uh, essentially is a, uh, based on the scheme that I attribute to Vlad and Buletic, but as I said, I'm a newcomer, so I don't want to essentially in these experiments that are mainly aiming to, let's say, clocks, so internal states, uh, you are, this can be done on uh, alkali atoms. You have the two hyperfine states uh, and then an excited state. And then you tune your cavity halfway between the two resonant transitions. And so uh, if the atoms are in the cavity, then you get a dispersion. Uh, and so you can probe in a, um, a dispersive way the passage of the atoms uh, through the cavity. And this uh, uh, gives you a collective measurement of the relative population. And so it produces an entanglement between the atom, among the atoms. Measurement in use? Is, uh, I don't know if termino terminologically is measurement in use. This interaction uh, gives you this um, uh, SZ squared term in the Hamiltonian so that you, you get this one axis uh, twisting that uh, you want in this case. Essentially, is what people have done in the in the clock for clocks uh, using the internal state the difference is that uh, here the two states are you see the internal state is still the ground state the singlet s0 the difference is in the two momenta which are the two arms that correspond to the two arms of the interferometer and so this means that you create this uh, squeezing on the momentum states not in the internal states which is what, in principle, you would like for, at least as the starting point, then to have an interferometer acting. Uh, then, of course, you want to keep this uh, entanglement along the interferometer, and then you enter the real, uh, and that was preliminarily demonstrated, for example, not for example, uh, so far only in uh, James Thompson group, and... Um, Yeah, thank you. I'm curious about many things you mentioned, but especially about the clock interferometer experiment that you plan to do that aims to test some of the things you predicted. And uh, the one of the big issues there is that you need um, relatively large superposition sizes, about 10 meters, and keep them coherent for a second. So is that the route that you plan and hope to, uh, to achieve? So that apparatus is not going to be 10 meters, but a few meters. Uh, so, uh, yeah, up to the ceiling is not a 10 meter apparatus, it will be a couple of meters. Uh, while the, the other one, it will be four meters. So, we are entering the game of longer. We had the plan of a 10 meter, uh, but I didn't get the authorization to build it anyway. So, now we are limited by bureaucratic uh, reasons. But, but the time scale, is it also on a second scale or is it a shorter? The time, uh, so be, be, because for this effect to work, you need enough proper time accumulation, 
over time, they're sufficiently different so you get which way information. Be, I, the way I see it is that it will be a first step towards the, the real experiment uh, with drones. With cadmium, you take advantage of the larger frequency, larger energy of the transition, which makes the experiment much more difficult because you have all uh, UV light, but uh, you, if you can make the experiment, then you have a higher energy difference between the two clock states. Thank you for the beautiful talk. Um, in the experiments where you moved the cloud very close to the vacuum chamber window, in the end, was it just you know miscellaneous scattered light on the vacuum chamber window that you think was going on? So in that case, it was not um, uh, the. Um, we also uh, used the glass, the, the window, the, but uh, part of the experiment where we really did. Uh, uh, we already had a, a, a mass, uh, we had put a mass in the vacuum system with a sandwich of masses of different materials, gold and aluminum, different density. But then we had a coating of gold. So this would have been, you know, the rather typical uh, structure that you use for micro cantilever. So you have uh, some gold uh, that gives you a shielding and then you modulate the gravitational field. That was the idea. Uh, our understanding is that some scattering effect was spoiling our lattice uh, regularity, and uh, so that makes sense. And as I, maybe I implied in what I said, it would have been nice to characterize it better, maybe, but then, uh, you know, you need uh, people who are motivated on that, and at some point this uh, did not happen. So, but the reason is, as I said, I, I was not able, of, it was not the scope to give an, on, an overview of what, but in, in Paris, there is a, another experiment going on now since some years. I don't know what is the status, but uh, they are not using strontium, but rubidium. But they will, there are other uh, efforts in that direction. Thank you for, for the great talk. If I heard it right, uh, you mentioned that it's a measure uh, mass of positronium. Yes, that's proposition to mass of mass of positronium. Yes, that's uh, somebody before for, did measure of this mass or just it's first time. Uh, if I understand the question, if this is the first experiment on positronium. Yeah, yeah, measure it from mass of so somebody, uh, somebody before just measure it mass of positronium, or that's, it will be first experiment. This would be the first experiment on gravity. Yeah, that's that's direct experiment, yeah. first time. Yeah, thank you. Yes, the yes. group I'm collaborating with uh, just I don't know, one year or a couple of years ago published a paper in which uh, for the first time they reported. Um, a interference with mm -hmm. the, uh, positronium, the charge of the particle. Yeah, so yeah. they had some material gratings and they could see the, um, the interference uh, of, for positronium. Mm -hmm. So my contribution that in my case was somehow obvious. I said, why material gratings? Let's use uh, light and laser, what we usually do with atoms. And then we found this um, scheme that would allow to um, uh, measure uh, gravity acceleration for positronium, mm -hmm. which is the way usually you want to go because with charged particles you cannot do such precision experiments because you have many spurious, any spurious electric field would, um, so these experiments must be done with neutral particles in my opinion, and positronium will not be the right one. Yeah, that would be great, that's first time, that's murder, that's yeah, antiparticle, mass of antiparticle. Yeah, yes. and as I said, the, the, the expert can explain that it's very different from anti-hydrogen because anti-hydrogen is mm -hmm. most, the mass of the proton is mostly done by binding energy, while here you're really testing mass. Uh... Sorry, just as a clarification, mm -hmm. is this measuring mass or is it measuring the acceleration of the coupling to gravity? Acceleration due to coupling with gravity. Not necessarily the same thing as measuring mass. That's all I'm trying to say. No, no. Yeah. Uh, well, I hope I said it mm -hmm. right. Yeah, but like antiprotons, you know, have been measured in the mass to charge ratio. Yeah, like 
there are plenty of antiparticles that have been measured in their mass charge ratios. Yes, yes, uh -huh. of course. But, but not the couple that we have. So no, no. The, the mass you can measure, Klaus Blaum, you put in so a so cyclotron, you do it uh, with so uh, 11 uh, digits. Oh, okay. No, uh, it's uh, what we are talking mm -hmm. about is gravitational interaction, gravity acceleration. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very and much. Of course, mass is an important role in that. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's, that, 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 that's good. Yeah, that's yeah. sure. Okay, so I think in the interest of time, we'll move on to our next speaker and thank uh, Guglielmo again. Thank you.